Good afternoon, and thank you everyone for your patience. Welcome back to our Global Women's Leadership Initiative Women in Defense series. Today, we are honored to have with us uh, Major General Retired Sharon Dunbar. I had the pleasure of working for General Dunbar about nine years ago. I first moved to DC and um, was about to be a mom. Uh, I was taking on a new job in a new city, and that job was incredibly complicated. It was about how we decide who are the people that we have to tap out of the force because we had to reduce the size of our force. Uh, General Dunbar had that portfolio. She also had the portfolio of, just, of reviewing the Fort Hood, Texas shootings, the sexual assault in the military, um, among other portfolios that she was taking on at that time. Um, we don't hand those things, uh, those opportunities, just to anybody in the military. We give them to our best. So today, please join me in welcoming General Dunbar, who um, currently serves as the Vice President of Federal Systems at General Dynamics. And she'll share with you her journey from the first being the third class woman to graduate the Air Force Academy, um, to becoming the first female to command our Air Force District of Washington, which among other things, hosts our Air Force One. Ladies and gentlemen, Sharon Dunbar. Well, thanks, Aries. And uh, you know, you all have had the opportunity to, to affiliate with Aries, and so you know what an awesome individual she is. This is the piece we're like, do we need to use this? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> they're instructing the view. Um, so, so Aries, thank you very much. And I uh, had the opportunity to uh, see the, the wind swept when Aries come uh, <laughs> figure out where I was on the other side of uh, the Reagan building, so I apologize for being late. Just goes to show how uh, vast the city is and how easily one can get lost. So I appreciate your patience. Um, so, you know, I guess I'll start a little bit with uh, um, kind of my career in the Air Force. I was a little bit of um, the two kids in the family, my brother and, uh, and me, and uh, my, I had a Korean mother. Uh, she immigrated to the United States in uh, 47 at the age of 23. And, uh, you know, when we were little, uh, living in Illinois, which uh, was not a, it was a pretty homogenous community, um, you know, we heard all kinds of things, and one of them was, uh, oh, your mother came here by boat. And uh, later on, I found out she actually did come by boat. Um, but, you know, we found her, all her immigration paperwork and things like that. It was pretty cool. Um, but we grew up in a, uh, a very kind of a modest uh, town, Bloomington Normal, Illinois. Uh, you know, my parents didn't have a whole lot of money. Um, my brother, at the age of five, was having to check out books from the public library on West Point and uh, had to sit at the table for years uh, upright practicing how he would do his 90 degree angle feeding himself so that he would have it made when he finally got into West Point which ultimately he did go to West Point and we dropped him off at West Point and um, my parents saw that there were females there and they said oh hey Sharon look there are females you ought to think about coming to West Point. And I said, I don't think so. But the whole way home in the Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme, um, all I heard <laughs> were, you know, we don't have a lot of money. It's a great education. You really ought to think about going to a service academy. So at least we opened the aperture beyond West Point. And uh, thanks to a number of great guidance counselors, I didn't go to West Point. I went to the Air Force Academy. <laughs> so <laughs> good job. Um, and, uh, you know, my parents were very happy because uh, they didn't have to worry about having to pay for our college and uh, ultimately uh, got a great education. But my plan was, uh, since I really had no particular desire to stay in the military, was to do my payback of the five years that I owed them for my uh, Air Force Academy education and then leave and go do other things. Um, but as life turns out, you can't plan it. Um, I uh, met my future husband when we were uh, freshmen, duallys at the Air Force Academy, so we've been hanging out now for close to 39 years. And, um, and we took assignments together, and we really, very similar to Aries, kind of played it by ear. You know, you just, we never committed that we were going to stay in. It was really if we could keep uh, ourselves together, um, literally and figuratively, and if we could keep, as we had two children, keep the family together, that really became the priority um, because in life, um, many people become so career focused and they think that, um, that the career is, is the ultimate. Um, but I, having had the opportunity of decades now of reflecting and I tell people um, that I talk to, you know, the number one priority is uh, you need to be happy in life and you need to make sure that you have a family because at the end of the day, it's the family that you're gonna be reflecting on and the people that you, whose lives you've touched, not 
necessarily what you accomplished, um, you know, in a career. Because I think um, in our society sometimes we uh, we don't pay enough attention to what you contribute in uh, in raising a family, and um, it's kind of hard these days to raise functional. Uh, good public servants and good people uh, who are going to go off and be great citizens in our country. Um, and, you know, we, we're all kind of chasing after whatever that bright, shiny object of a career is and, and forget that, you know, you, you need to be grounded. And there are a lot of people, I have a lot of, uh, in my peer group, um, of general officers who are females. It was about a third, a third, and a third. A third uh, were married um, and very few had children, but some did have children. Um, there were others who were who had children who were diverse, divorced, and then we had about a third who never chose to get married, and uh, and then we had about a third who were married and chose to never have children. Um, some just never wanted children, but most who said that they didn't have children, they uh, decided that the career was not conducive to them having children. And so, in uh, in a variety of forums, uh, I, I find that kind of sad that in any kind of career, um, and, and you see that we were kind of talking about. Uh, women in in various positions and um, in public office uh, and positions across the world. I need to have that on. Okay, I'm getting the high sign. Thank you. Yeah, oh, I, I can tell the difference. I now. was going to casually move that in front of you. <laughs> I don't know that there's a casual way of doing I that. Know. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you know, one of the things that uh, if you look at where where women are, are postured and sort of um, in 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 a lot of societies, uh, the more that women are contributing and the more that they're progressing, uh, there is an association as with uh, declining birth rate. And, um, and it's because it's so hard to find that balance. So I think that um, societally for us, it's very important for us to be mindful of that and, and, and as you all have these discussions to think about um, how you can have a fruitful career, how you can uh, self-actualize and at the same time uh, not feel like it is a choice of one versus the other or that you're sub-optimizing. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that and, uh, when I revert back to my career reflections. But, um, you know, on aggregate, that's just a trend that we see. And, uh, and I, I know here in the studies that, that you all do, um, it, it is, uh, it's going to be one thing in the government sectors. Mm -hmm. It's going to be quite another in the private sectors, and I would argue it's going to be far more pronounced in the private sector um, than it is in the public. So. Um, but that's my thesis. You can, you know, a couple years from now when you we'll get all facts. your data, you yeah. can let me know. So, um, you know, I'll kind of go back to my Air Force career. Um, you know, we decided that we were going to play it by ear, and uh, my husband flew fighter jets, and he had, you know, some cool assignments, and I was just kind of tagging along for the ride. And then at some point, um, we were not going to get assigned together, and so we had to make the decision. This was after the first Gulf War, uh, where he flew, and he uh, received high commendations, was sort of uh, the one who was really going to have the leadership track. But the airlines were hiring, and uh, when I had the discussion with him about what I would do. I actually had no idea what I would do, but I mean, I figured that, you know, how hard can it be? Um, but he's the one who said, well, airlines are hiring. How about I get out and you stay in for a little while longer, for a little while longer. A little while longer was like one more assignment for family stability so that we were not both out there um, holding up signs trying to um, be able to feed the kids. Uh, but after that assignment, I ended up getting promoted early and I could not get out as planned. Uh, and so from you know, that segment of my career, which was largely focused on uh, contracting, buying things for the Air Force, I transitioned into legislative affairs and went to the Pentagon. Um, and that was all great. Uh, I had the opportunity to work over in the Senate for Deon Coates, who's now the DNI, uh, who is just a spectacular and very principled individual. And then um, thought I would escape out of the Pentagon uh, to go do something else back in the field because it is always the staff versus going out in the field where the field is fun. You know, you're working with people and when you're with staff, you're with staff. Um, so, <laughs> but Aries was staff and Aries was fun. And Aries was um, fun. So that's right. Yeah. I, we had a fun time. But um, so uh, I ended up not even interviewing. I just got a uh, notice that I was selected to be the military assistant for the Undersecretary of the Air Force, who is the uh, the number two political appointee in the Air Force, and um, a guy by the name of Rudy DeLeon, uh, somebody who really, in the grand scheme, and this would have been uh, probably at the 15-year point in my career, I'd never had a mentor. Um, 
I've never worked for a female boss, but I've, in all the people that I work for, I never had anybody who ever kind of stepped up to say, hey, you ought to think about doing this, you ought to think about doing that, you probably don't realize you've got more potential than you give yourself credit for. And, uh, and he's also one who, um, at uh, it was spring semester of, um, I think my son's, he was sixth grade, and he had a, uh, uh, an orchestra concert, and it was the last one of the year. So I went in and asked Secretary De Leon if he wouldn't mind if I left early so I could make the seven o'clock concert. And he said, I, and I said, it's the last one of the year, I probably ought to be there. And he says, well, what happened to all the other ones? And I said, well, I missed them. And he says, why did you miss them? And I said, because I was working for you. And he said, but you never said anything. And I said, I didn't think you'd care. And he says, wrong assumption on your part. I would have let you go because those things are important. So that's where I learned you have to ask things. People can't read your mind. Um, and a lot of times in uh, we're, whether you are a female or you're a minority or you're female and a minority, uh, you're loath to sort of look like you need to ask for anything. You want to just be the one who's doing it on your own and not let anybody see you sweat. And there's a lot of self-sacrifice that's associated with that. And I would argue that it's unnecessary self-sacrifice because we're sort of not proficient in sort of what I would call the power of the ask. Uh, and I think we all need to figure out how do, you, how do you just lay it out there? Because for the most part, people have gone through that themselves or they know other people who've gone through that themselves. And, uh, and I know a lot of other people had no problem asking. I just had an issue with asking. So that was sort of hurdle number one over getting over my hang up of uh, sort of not exposing any vulnerabilities and really kind of shifted um, my view of my kids who I had pretty much, I would say, cloistered them off um, because I figured that was sort of my, uh, my background responsibility to um, acknowledging that that's just kind of a whole person thing. They're, it's part of the package deal. And, um, and that I'm not gonna hide the fact that I have kids. I don't feel like I have to hide that. And uh, it, it really was pivotal for me. Um, and I don't know that other people, if they've had that kind of issue, I just, as I, as I think back on that, um, I realize how uh, needless it was that I just felt like nobody should know that I had kids. It was the same thing when I was pregnant with both of them. I like started buying bigger uniforms so nobody knew that I was pregnant until about the five year point and they thought I was needed to be put on that weight program. And then I go, well, I really have an excuse. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, it makes you wonder, like, you know, why, why do we have a culture like that? Is it the culture or is it the individual? And if it's the individual, you know, we need to work with people on that. And that's something that, uh, you know, over time, as I would see other people trying to struggle with those issues, I would try to help out with that just based on personal experience because I never really had the fortune of having somebody who um, had – that I looked up to that went through that, or frankly, that I knew that went through that. So um, I worked for Mr. DeLeon for, uh, for about three years total, a year uh, when he was the Undersecretary of the Air Force, and then he moved down um, to be the Undersecretary of Defense for what we call personnel and readiness. And that's when I ended up getting into the personnel field, of which Aries comes out of. And, uh, and I have to say, you know, this is a swift justice, uh, you know, I'm a, a I have a lot of faith in the good man upstairs, and but I think that's his way of making me eat crow because when I came into the Air Force, two things I did not want to do. I did not want to do personnel, and I did not want to do public affairs. And I ended up uh, having to do personnel by virtue of the fact that my boss went into that, and I, I learned so much. Um, and, and I learned ultimately that the two things that anybody needs when they're running an organization is an understanding of the people and the programs that support the people, um, and how to communicate with the people and about the programs that support the people and about programs in general. Um, without those two things, you cannot be a, uh, a highly functioning leader and you can't even be a highly functioning organization. Um, so that was another, another pivotal point for me because uh, you know, oftentimes we find ourselves having to do things that um, we did not wanna do and uh, you gotta make the most of it. And if you look at it from sort of what do you learn out of it, um, you know, the, the blinders at times can come off and that's a good thing. So out of that, I ended up doing my first command in personnel. And uh, command, uh, Aries done command. She did her command uh, overseas in the in a deployed area, um, Southwest Asia. Um, but of course, she's career uh, personnel, and everybody was fighting for Aries because she's all that in a bag of chips. Plus, she is personnel. 
So imagine me, I was contracting, I did legislative affairs, and I just went into personnel, and I'm on the command screening list because you know I at least had a decent record going for me, but there were no people who are pounding down the door going, I want Sharon Dunbar to go run this personnel squadron because I had no experience. Um, but ultimately somebody, there was a taker there, I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I ended up going off to uh, do um, command and uh, that, you know, in the Air Force and in the military, the biggest uh, opportunity you have is to command an organization, to lead people, to lead a, a particular function, um, because that's where you have the most opportunity to have an influence in shaping people's lives. So, uh, and that was something that, uh, up until that point, I said, Why do, what's this thing with command? Why do people want to go do command? I'm happy. At that point, I was kind of a, a staff convert. I like this staff thing. You know, it's very predictable. You drive in, you, you know, 20 hours later, you leave. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, but when, you, when you're out in the field and you're with uh, the airmen who are uh, making, making things happen, uh, many, uh, I mean, vast majority coming from all walks of life, uh, it is a, uh, really gets you grounded all over again. Uh, so I did successive command. I did, um, uh, was at Alsace Air Force Base, which is in the middle of nowhere, um, which I wasn't all that happy about going there, but it was a blessing in disguise. It was a wonderful opportunity. Uh, and after that, I went to uh, Lackland Air Force Base, where I ran the Air Force's basic training, uh, another superb opportunity. <coughs> and that's just kind of a plug for all of you on um, who comes into our Air Force. And I, I would like to say that the Air Force, um, we have the highest scores who come into the Air Force because we are um, sort of the, uh, the most technically demanding. Um, but some of these individuals, uh, they had never had a cooked meal um, served to them, you know, and of course serving is, you go through and you serve yourself, but somebody serves it, they're cooking it. Most of them had grown up on ramen and, uh, and things they stick in the microwave. Um, we had one, uh, one young lady who, as we went around the room, uh, there are 60 in a bunk that's about as big as this room. Um, so, you know, the beds are all kind of crowded out there between 12 to 18 inches apart. Um, and she said that the best thing about basic training for her was the opportunity for her to have her own bed. Um, she grew up in a family of six kids and uh, they had a three bedroom place and all the kids, um, both genders were kind of packed in like sardines into the bedrooms. Um, and, uh, and then we had another one who um, came in who had never, I don't think he'd ever been to a dentist before. And, uh, and we were able to get him in to get his teeth straightened out um, and uh, I can't even describe sort of how he looked, but these are people who come from the rural areas, they come from the inner cities, they come from all walks of life, they come from, believe it or not, you know, people who uh, are in the 99th percentile um, scoring, but who never had an opportunity based on uh, the socioeconomic status that they had. Um, and they're given an opportunity, uh, they see that they can go get their education. Uh, some are now surgeons in the military because they had that capacity, they just didn't have the opportunity. And so I hearken back to the military as really being kind of that last bastion that we have in America of social mobility where everybody comes in, uh, it is a level playing field and uh, if you work hard, uh, if you are earnest and if you have your moral groundings about you, you will do very well because you know we train you, we give you opportunities after uh, one after another. And I joke many times that had I not gone to the Air Force Academy, I'd probably still be at Steak and Shake um, working as a waitress uh, trying to get my tips there. Um, I couldn't do that actually because I quit the job after three weeks. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but you know, it is a, uh, it, it is a, it is a tremendous um, institution that America has and it's one that other countries seek to emulate, um, but it is not easily replicable. So I just wanted to put the plug in for the earnestness of the people who serve in our armed forces. Um, so that's what I learned out of basic training. And then after that, I went to a place called Hill Air Force Base in Utah, um, had about 23,000 folks. We had uh, um, F-16 fighters there and a huge depot. And uh, so I was leading what we call an air base wing and it had uh, everything from communicators to security forces to um, uh, logisticians. It's basically, you're, you're like the city manager for 23,000 people. And, uh, and then after that, went to the Pentagon um, doing manpower which is a kind of quantitative modeling um, before Aries and I had the uh, systematic um, reduction of people. Uh, I actually spent many months trying to make the case to then Secretary of Defense Gates on why we should be increasing end strength and we were successful in getting him to approve that. 
Um, and then, then they put me in the other job and said, now you get to undo it. And, uh, and ultimately, um, not being a personnel person, the reason for all that is because uh, whether you're in a private organization uh, or a publicly traded company like uh, General Dynamics, whether you are in a nonprofit institution, whether you are in academia, uh, the number one expense is people. Um, when you look at the salaries, when you look at uh, the fringe benefits, the, the rolled up cost of an individual is um, much higher than most people anticipate. And in aggregate, when you're trying to quickly, very quickly reduce the budget, um, that's the first thing that people look to do. Um, but it is, uh, it's not easy to do, and it is very hard, uh, and you do oftentimes um, irreparable damage to goodwill. Um, for people, for your employees, and uh, it's, but it is cyclical. And I think, you know, we see that the government goes through this, certainly the military went through it, and, uh, and that's my turn to give props to Aries because Aries came in. Um, uh, not yet, uh, I, I think that um, her son Jax was like a glimmer in her eye at that point, um, I, I, and uh, worked those long hours. I mean, I think we left about eight o'clock at night and we would joke that we would do the walk of shame out of the Pentagon. You know, they'd close all the doors but one and then you'd have to walk through, kind of like the weather you walk through today, uh, <laughs> to get out to be able to catch the Metro home. But um, uh, I am a huge Aries Gibson fan. Um, Aries Mensler now, we went through the name change as well. Um, so she's progressed. <laughs> but uh, you know, um, in Aries I see a lot of me. And so, uh, you know, She's, anytime she asks me to do something, I pretty much do it. So uh, thank you for everything that you've done. You've just been uh, an awesome role model for me as well. So uh, after that, I went over to um, command the Air Force District of Washington, which has uh, the Air Force's Homeland Security mission, has um, a lot of the uh, kind of the diplomatic piece of it, has uh, the ceremonial aspects of it, and, um, you know, has responsibility for the runway that hosts Air Force One, but also has a, a couple classified missions that it supports um, that are related to Homeland Security. And, uh, and at that point, you know, the kids are out of the house. Um, you know, my, my kids are just awesome individuals. I have a 32-year-old son who's an Army captain, um, finishing up his master's at Georgetown in, in finance and is getting out of the Army this summer. And a uh, daughter who is uh, 28 and uh, will never leave Southern California. She went to undergrad at USC, stayed on to go to law school, and is now an attorney at Netflix. So that's my push for Netflix. But uh, <laughs> um, love and life there. But so the kids are out of the house. They're doing all kinds of great things. And, um, you know, as I am at the Air Force District of Washington, uh, having discussions with my boss about next assignments, uh, you know, which would have been a promotable assignment, um, it was not conducive to my husband who had popped around, um, you know, he left the Air Force to go get with American Airlines. He's been with American Airlines for a while. Uh, we were going to move to a location that was pretty much Delta country. And, uh, and I, when I had the discussion with him, it would have meant him commuting from uh, Montgomery, Alabama. I think you know the job. Um, Montgomery, Alabama to either Birmingham or Atlanta, back to D.C. or Miami to fly for American. And um, I remember when I said, hey, what do you think about going to Maxwell Air Force Base, and he just kind of slumped in the chair. And these are things where, you know, I worry about the kids, never really worried about my husband, because, you know, he's just been a great partner. But at some point, it's like, it has to not be always about you. And uh, he was quite comfortable with commuting out of, you know, DC, this is his base, um, versus now having to go one more assignment uh, to go do something. And uh, just the look in his eyes was pretty much, um, that kind of said it all. And that goes back to you have to think about um, compromise um, because some of us are so type A, uh, you just it's, you want to do what you can do to the maximum extent possible and you forget that you have people who have supported you time and time again who never let you down. Sorry. <laughs> and at some point you have to think about the people that are there. So when I talk about family, <clears throat> I usually get choked up. Sorry. Um, I can talk about missions and everything like that and jobs, but it really is uh, for all of us who have family. Uh, you need to be thinking about making sure that through it all, you come out of it unscathed, and more importantly, they come out of it unscathed. And so, um, and, and I think that it's tougher for women with husbands because um, in the past, 
gosh, I can think about when I came in the Air Force. Um, uh, there were, I, there were no, I'm trying to think of my husband's unit and my unit. Uh, I mean, I was the only female, and there were none in his in a fighter uh, squadron. Um, so the women tend to do the sacrificing. And um, now you find more men who are doing it. But it is still very difficult for, uh, for male spouses to up and leave. More companies now. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal that talked about uh, companies are doing more outreach for men. Um, because whether you like it or not, you know, men and women who are well-educated or even people who don't have high education want to feel that they are contributing. Uh, they don't want to feel like they're the ones who are sort of the ones who are mopping up, the second-class citizen who uh, is essentially the last or the afterthought in the career move or the career progression. And, um, you know, so I think that it's great that we're moving to that point, but, um, but we're still not there. And so those people who are making, women who are making career moves, uh, who have a male spouse, that's tough. Um, you know, now we have obviously same gender couples, a little different um, dynamic. Um, maybe not, maybe it's a different dynamic, still some challenges, obviously, that are associated there. Um, so, you know, in the end, uh, as I left, I went on with General Dynamics, a tremendous company um, that has been, when people ask about the transition, I tell them it was so seamless. Uh, I went from one high values organization to another, um, and that was what I found most compelling about General Dynamics is that uh, it has an ethos. Uh, that Phoebe Novakovic, uh, a female, by the way, you know, I was going to make that point. right, <laughs> uh, who um, you know leads this massive organization of 100,000 folks with 10 different companies, um, and never misses a beat. Um, but the core values of General Dynamics are trust, honesty, alignment, and transparency. And uh, you know those are uh, values that um, she expects everybody to exhibit in terms of. Um, certainly, as a government contractor, being um, very compliant, um, you know, not skirting on issues, to also being uh, developing trusting relationships, to living up to um, what we say that we're going to do, uh, even if it costs us money, uh, even if we do so at a loss, but fulfilling our commitment, um, and then making sure that we're taking care of people. And she adds in uh, the humility aspect of it, which uh, is very important. And uh, you know, we like to um, make sure that we're also giving back to the communities that we work in and live in and play in. Um, so it's a tremendous, tremendous company that has afforded me opportunities. That HR piece that I said that I really didn't want to do, um, that was my entry into it um, because they needed somebody to merge um, two companies. We had uh, two of the GD companies. They decided that they would merge together, um, and they were both about two and a half billion dollars each. So they kind of created the five billion dollar company we are, um, and uh, very different cultures between the two companies. Very different systems. Very different operating uh, ways. Different locations. And uh, you know, so through mergers and acquisitions, you can decide that you're going to kind of keep uh, entities separate and distinct. Um, but that's not really, it's not a, you don't get the fulsome advantage as you do if you try to fully integrate um, organizations in. So that was really, it truly was a three year process. I thought, oh, a year and we'll be through with this. And um, yeah, no, it, it was about a three year process. And so after that, I, I suppose maybe I paid my penance. I learned a ton um, because you get the out of HR and out of all those functional organizations, you get the broad purview of the business um, because you're working with all the lines of business and you're working with all the functional areas. And so, um, you know, now I, as of five months ago, uh, am leading um, a little startup that we have. Uh, it's a federal systems that's focused on uh, justice and homeland security. So there's that homeland security piece. Um, and uh, you know it is uh, largely from a um, protecting our citizens standpoint, and um, you know ranges from things that are classified to things that are mainstream to things that uh, that you should know that go on, but you probably don't know that go on, <laughs> and uh, you know that keep us all as good citizens. So it's a uh, it's a very cool business. And earlier, and uh, I was meeting with our Coast Guard customers over at Homeland Security in their nice new beautiful building over there at St. Elizabeth's. Um, but uh, it's an opportunity to learn more about aspects of the government that I had not been uh, really that familiar with, um, other than my stint doing Homeland Security uh, missions working in Air Force District of Washington. But the look back is, um, particularly for the young folks that you know are in the audience, and, and everybody is that 
the, um, you can't plan life. You know, all these things that happen, they, they just happen. And, uh, and you have to ultimately decide, you know, what your compass is, what you're drawn to, what your interests are, um, and preserve the core. And the core piece is the thing I was getting sappy about, is family, the people who mean the most of you. Because things will come and go, experiences will come and go. And as long as you're somebody who can integrate these things in and you can kind of figure out how they connect with the next thing, um, you're, gonna, it, you're gonna find yourselves decades later going, wow, you know, so I couldn't have made that path up if I would have tried. Because all those points you learn from and all those points that ultimately contribute to whether it's your resume, uh, more importantly than your resume, is really what you bring to an organization, and that is the collective of your experiences um, in a career and uh, things you volunteer for and in life. And, and I would also submit um, it's the things that you juggle on the, on the home front. Um, the, when you're forced to juggle all those things, it really makes you somebody who is uh, more grounded, you understand your strengths and weaknesses, uh, and you understand how to balance many different things. And, uh, and that's what I think makes, uh, makes people great, ultimately. Um, the one-trick ponies aren't the ones who excel, it's the people who can multitask and, uh, and motor their way through uh, some trying circumstances um, and learn from the things that don't go so well and uh, apply them to the next big challenge that faces them. So that's pretty much uh, the spiel. And uh, I know I've talked probably a little longer than I should have, but um, it's kind of stories wrapped into stories. And I'd, I was watching you closely. I didn't see anybody falling asleep, so that was my cue that I'm doing okay. <laughs> no, there, there's a lot in there, and I want to... Um, we have a well, great audience with people from the State Department sitting in the audience, and Aries and I have talked several times about uh, career choices, you know, I, one of the questions just to get your point of view on and, and push a little bit that I do push people, is it, is it possible for, for a couple, um, both working for the federal government, to have a career? Does somebody always have to sacrifice at some point? Well, I, I definitely think it's possible because we see it uh, quite a bit. But, um, yeah, you know, I do think that the more senior you are, the tougher it becomes because timing becomes an issue and opportunities become an issue. So the timing of the opportunities, oftentimes it's, it's just a matter of luck. Um, I, I think the government and certainly the military uh, are in a far different place today than they were when I first came in where um, being a dual military couple uh, was just – you were kind of uh, wasn't favored um, because I think they they just thought that uh, only one should be dedicated yep. to now in the federal government and for the military they realize that they get more bang for the buck it isn't that they get twice the value uh, they get an exponential uh, impact because they understand the culture they understand the sacrifices they understand the puts and takes uh, right. and uh, and and also, you know, the network is bigger because then they can they can help to um, to work to sequence assignments. And I think um, the bosses are more willing to listen on the timing issue. Um, they are more sympathetic to that. And a lot of that too is because now we see more leaders who have um, raised families and they understand that. So uh, you know, that's that's how social progress occurs in society. Um, you know, it does take time, but it takes people who have experienced some things themselves to finally get there, and, uh, and the good people will be empathetic based on the circumstances, as opposed to some people who, um, I remember I used to get that, well, I didn't have to do that. It's like, okay, well, you know, <laughs> this wasn't possible when you were in, you yeah, know? exactly. Um, right. Yeah, it's not. And just a last question, which is, you know, a little bit, I, I suppose, controversial or General Dynamics being a, a female CEO of that company. Do you notice that in a way that's like, this is clearly a female? Or how, how is that if people say to you, what's it like to work for a female CEO? What would be your, what would be your response from a public affairs standpoint? Well, I, I think that it's, uh, it's imperceptible um, because, you know, most people will look at General Dynamics and you know, it's a phenomenal corporation, and it happens to be led by Phoebe. Mm -hmm. Phoebe, um, but if you look at General Dynamics and what Phoebe has done to General Dynamics, um, it, she's catapulted it. She has. So, she um, has. you know, causality, 
pretty strong, um, and I and I think uh, you know that certainly when you look at the uh, defense corporations that are you know Lockheed Martin, um, you know it used to be BAE, mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's um, it's pretty tremendous, and I and I there's just no disputing yeah. uh, when you have female leaders who are uh, who are making it happen across across the globe is yeah. what your focus on, you know, in the United States, in Washington, D.C., in the government, uh, in the military. Um, you know, it's, uh, no, I don't, I don't have anybody who says, what's it like, you know? Yeah. I mean, I suppose some of the guys who work for me might have from other people, what's it like? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and, and, you know, in the end, I really don't care um, exactly. because uh, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of immaterial. And, uh, and I think, you know, hopefully we've moved beyond that point where, because that gets to the hang up if you think about that. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be worried about that as opposed to, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, you're just doing the very best you can, and, and uh, the success speaks for itself. You know, I hope, I think, um, you know, we were talking on the way up about what we're doing in the Women in Public Service Project with the index and the data, sort of build that evidence base, because I don't think we're there in public service as we may be in the private sector to understanding that, that it doesn't matter, but that having women at the table does drive a return on profits and does drive more creative ideas and diverse ideas and that's sort of coming out in the private sector but also these examples of showing that that you can have enormous results whether you are a man or a woman but that women can have the same results and be change makers and so I think we, we still need to get there I believe in terms of not asking that question but I think in public service we we have a way to go still to showing that that's the case yeah. but uh, but we will talk about that further I want to turn it over to the audience for your questions. Um, and I don't know, I think we are, are we Facebook living this, which means people should use the microphone, so uh, Elise has a microphone. Great, so who would like to, there's a lot in there, we talked about a lot. Gail Maddox. And if you could identify yourself as well so that we all know who you are. I'm Gail Maddox, and I'm a global fellow here at the Wilson Center, but um, in my f uh, that's non-residential. Um, I was here last year uh, for a year, and um, I teach at the U.S. Naval Academy. And uh, so I've uh, watched the changes, tremendous changes, um, at the Naval Academy um, between um, when uh, I had students, my midshipmen in the first years, and then... Uh, later, and I'm sure you've seen that as well uh, at the Air Force Academy, uh, and I've been out to the where Air Force Academy quite a bit, so I've seen it, seen it too. Um, I guess one of the questions that um, w there were a couple of things that that you said that I thought were really interesting. One was on mentor, um, and um, you know I know two other women who were mentored by Rudy mm. DeLeon. <laughs> And so he must be tremendous. He I've is. met him a few times, but I've never really talked to him about it. And uh, and I think that uh, that's really important that we think about the role that men can play as as women come up, because we wouldn't be as far as we are in the changes uh, that there have been if there hadn't been men who had reached down Absolutely. also and uh, uh, and reached out uh, to women and supported them. Um, so I just wanted to tell you that, that I, I do know some, some people who seem to have had the same experience. Um, and then the question was about talking about um, why you need to get off early. And I think that a lot of women confront this, this dilemma. And I've noticed that, and I've even talked to um, the senior women in my, in, in my department uh, about it, that and when we were when we first got there, um, I would just I, I mean I would maybe even be late in the front if we were in a department meeting or something. Uh, I wouldn't say I've got to go pick her up. Of course, she didn't have cell phones then, so it was kind of hard to do. But I did have I did have au pairs, so I, I did have some help. But um, but the women now, and I think it's terrific. They'll say, you know, I got to pick up at four o'clock or at five o'clock and I'm not going to go on to this me you know, I can't stay in this meeting until until six but just and do you have the sense that any of them nowadays get hurt by that or get um, somehow disadvantaged in the job mm -hmm. and um, particularly 
I don't know, maybe sometimes even women, I think, will be stricter. Maybe the older generation, we had to, we didn't admit to it, so. Well, it's, that's a great question. And uh, um, I find as many men as women who say, hey, I pick up. And I think that's a great thing. Uh, I was actually scheduling a, uh, a visit at one of our locations, and um, the, the young man who is, um, is hosting the visit said, do you mind if we start at 9.30 because um, I need to drop my kids off, and uh, a lot of us have young kids, and, uh, and he, you know, he commutes from, I think, Rockville into like uh, the Herndon area of Virginia, quite a hefty commute. But, Bravo for him for raising that, and of course, you know, I could accommodate that. I think the, the trick is if you are the one who's leaving early all the time um, while everybody else is working late and you're, you're not finding that flex, um, then, then that you may be disadvantaged um, because uh, people understand circumstances, but then if you understand what the demands of the jobs are, that you happen to have over the course of time, uh, you got to find sort of how do you how do you fill that in, and um, you know a lot of couples will one will drop off, the other will pick up, uh, in order for people to be able to sort of um, split the time, um, or they'll find uh, somebody else who family, friend, what have you, to be able to do that. So I think uh, it really just depends, um, but I probably find myself in that category, and not recently, but I do remember when I was in the military where I had somebody who, uh, it was a peer, and um, we're working um, base closure back when I was working legislative uh, affairs, and uh, I would stay till 10 o'clock at night because that's what was required for briefs that started the next morning or calls we had to make to members of Congress, and, uh, and she would leave routinely at 5.30, but then she would be there wanting to do all the other stuff first thing in the morning. Um, that's not fair to the rest of the team. So it really is a, uh, it's a dynamic that has to be managed. And I think, uh, you know, as long as the team understands sort of how people manage it uh, and, and you have folks who are all in and they're taking care of one another, but it's like a group project, you know. You, you don't want the, a couple people who are basically the economic rent writers while everybody else is carrying the load. Other, Lynn, look, you look like you're raising your hand down there. <laughs> Excellent presentation, General. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, my name is Lynn Platt, and I'm a State Department Fellow here at the Wilson Center. Um, and uh, like you, uh, have been uh, in a tandem uh, situation where my husband and I were both officers. Uh, and then, bless his heart, he retired early to come and join me uh, in my previous assignment. Um, so, you know, we've had to work those uh, dynamics as well of uh, keeping uh, the family and the relationship uh, together and, and putting that as a priority. But I want to uh, kind of switch gears and ask you globally now, uh, as you go out and inspire uh, not only uh, young women, but also other people with your accomplishments, um, is public service still uh, and, and military service still a career that uh, people are attracted to. Uh, I mean, you were absolutely eloquent in, you know, explaining uh, this uh, place uh, that that lifts people up from difficult circumstances and is a meritocracy, uh, which is something that military uh, and civil service and foreign service have done uh, for generations. But it seems like in recent years, there's such a criticism of, uh, you know, bureaucrats or uh, people in government service. Uh, is that still a place that draws uh, the best and the brightest from our society? Uh, it's a fascinating question. And, uh, you know, I think the State Department's fortunate, as is uh, CIA uh, and, and NSA, um, to have academic institutions that um, are feeders, um, premier academic institutions that um, cultivate uh, public servants, at least for uh, to draw that interest, to get them in. Uh, retention is always an issue across the board for all of the uh, um, 
all the aspects of people who want to enter into some form of, um, of serving their government. Um, you know, from a military standpoint, um, we're, we're a far cry from where we were in the 1970s. And even, uh, you know, when I entered into the Air Force Academy, which is in the late 70s, early 80s, um, military was not looked upon favorably at all. Still had the post-Vietnam era um, aura, which was negative. And, uh, and here today, we, we celebrate uh, those who s serve in uniform, um, which is, uh, it's such a great place to be um, because they deserve, uh, they deserve all that. Um, from a government service standpoint, uh, certainly the last few years, um, government service has taken its fair share of hits. And the State Department more recently has, uh, has had its fair share of morale issues, not knowing uh, if it's respected, if its mission um, is, uh, and they <laughs> work so hard to be able to uh, basically prevent things from happening through diplomatic uh, means. Um, it's kind of, I think, a little untethered, um, and it's been very unsettling for people who are in the State Department. Um, I hope that that is just a short-term phenomenon, um, because I do believe that ultimately, uh, when you look at all the things that take place in government that uh, I, I like to think, and perhaps I'm Pollyannish, that people have a healthy respect for people who work in the government. Um, but uh, recently, you know, there, we've, we've had to deal with um, cuts, reductions, and we've had to deal with hiring freezes. Um, and this stems back to where we've had um, through continuing resolution to uh, closure of the government to funding issues associated with uh, the Budget Control Act, you name it. There's been a compounding of, of issues uh, that have kind of led us to the place where we are today. But I say that, and yet, you know, my son, who uh, um, the one who majored in rugby at William & Mary, is seeing his, <laughs> is seeing his, uh, his buddy um, off this coming weekend, who's going, uh, joining the State Department um, Foreign Service and heading off to Manila. And, uh, you know, so there are, there are young people who still aspire to be able to serve their government and to be able to, uh, to do things that, um, via the federal government in the international sector, uh, to be able to help make a difference. And I think, you know, that noble calling is something that um, goes back to the universities that have, I think, such a profound influence on uh, what we produce out of graduates. Um, if, uh, if we're denigrating institutions during that time, and certainly, you know, uh, we had, um, what, two months ago, um, a teacher in California denigrating the military, um, it, it all starts at an early age, but certainly in those formative years of college, um, I, I think that the universities can continue to be able to produce the pipeline of the talent that we need. Thank you, Liz. Other questions? Amy. So I'm currently uh, with the Women in Public Service Project, but I'm a senior executive at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And following on uh, Lynn's comment, um, one of the things that um, when I came in in the 80s, in public service had a mixed record. Unfortunately, it seems like we are in a bad spot now. And I, I think one of the things that um, I'm concerned about is the policies now that treat civil service distinct from military. And one of the things that I appreciate about what Aries has brought with the speakers and the, the look at women in leadership in the pipeline and the senior leadership positions is that I, I, I'm concerned that we don't need more divisions, but we actually need more, I, I guess, best practices and, and, and a closing of the loop across the, the different silos, um, civil sector and military. And I just, now that you're in private sector, I wonder if you had a perspective on that. Well, in general, I think, uh, gosh, probably the last 10 years, we've done more on learning from an interagency perspective. I would agree with you. Uh, we have actually, you know, the very thing that, um, that people will malign maybe federal service for is the silos and sort of the bloated bureaucracy. 
And, uh, and I think good governance is that you take a look at where you have opportunities to, um, to leverage uh, capabilities. Um, so you have departments that are used to being very uh, department agency specific, and yet um, there are opportunities for creating centers of excellence that can support uh, multi-mission aspects. Um, we're not there yet. That is a, that is a, talk about a culture change. Mm -hmm. But when you think about um, the savings that you could have and the impact that you could have, I think that that is a uh, natural migration to goodness. I just don't, um, I mean, I'm a realist as well. I don't know that that's going to happen in the next five years, but it could conceivably happen in the next 10 years because uh, if you want to look at, um, it, it provides more opportunity for growth as well because you have people who are, um, who are working in an area that um, spans its ability to support and uh, I liken that to when you think about procurement. Um, you have agencies who provide procurement support across different departments uh, because they happen to be the center of excellence and they can get it done faster. And, uh, and sometimes they, people go to them because their own departments are unable to provide that level of uh, professional prompts support. So uh, that's a model. So in the interest of time, I, it's, um, this has been great. I mean, I was writing down my, my takeaways, which are um, a little bit your story is similar to my story in a very different way of just sort of life isn't predictable. It's not a straight line, yet you can lead across, you know, various sectors and across both various industry, public and private sector. The compromise piece, I think the important thing, too, that is the, the asking, you know, the being able to say, I need to leave or I need to be here, you know, whichever the, I always call that testing your assumptions, too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, the, and the family, you know, what's important to you as a whole person, right? Not just your career, but really being able to, to figure out all of those pieces. But as a, as, a, as a federally funded think tank dedicated to public service globally, I think all of us in the room, we are honored to have you. And thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you very much.